Hello, welcome to the 5.04 Enthalpy of Phase Changes screencast. I'm Mrs. Willie, and let's get started. So let's start with anatomy of a phase change, which is breaking it down and looking at it by part by part. So a phase change is a physical change. It affects the form of a substance, not the chemical bonds itself. So this is going to specifically focus on intermolecular forces and not intramolecular forces. So we're looking at the secondary forces, not the primary forces that hold chemicals together. And it's not the breaking or forming of chemical bonds or primary intramolecular bonds. Enthalpy is the heat or energy under constant pressure. So if I'm looking at this picture that I have here, I can see in a solid, I have a nice structure. So I have my four particles and those four particles are in an organized truck structure, fairly close together, attracted to one another, fairly close together. The intermolecular forces here are actually very strong and their potential energy is very weak because those forces are so strong and they're organized that they are weak in terms of potential energy. The second is a liquid in that you can see you've gained average kinetic energy. So there's some more movement in a liquid, though they do still have a set volume. They take up the volume of their container. Um, and their intermolecular particles are a little weaker because they have more average kinetic energy. Therefore, their potential energy goes up because their intermolecular forces are weaker. Then you have the last example here that is a gas. As you can see, the average kinetic energy in the gases has gained or, or gotten much higher. And so you have more potential energy and very weak intermolecular forces. So again, let's talk about what an intermolecular force is. It's the secondary force the forces of interaction between molecules and other neighboring particles, which could be atoms or ion. It can be attraction or repulsion. So now let's look at while you're in the act of heating or cooling a sample. So if you are in the act of cooling a sample, let's say a gas, you are affecting the average kinetic energy or the motion of those particles. So as you are decreasing the temperature or decreasing the average kinetic energy, the potential energy is staying the same. The, interact, uh, the interactions between the particles is the same. As you decrease the average kinetic energy in a liquid, while you are in the liquid state, the average kinetic energy is also decreasing, but the potential energy is the same while in the liquid state. While you're in the solid state, the average kinetic energy is decreasing as you decrease your temperature, but the potential energy is staying the same. So the opposite would look would be the way it would look if you were heating the sample. So if you were heating a solid sample, the average kinetic energy is going to be increasing but your potential energy is still staying the same. So those interactions between the particles are the same And then you have, uh, in the liquid state, the average kinetic energy is increasing and the potential energy is staying the same. And then 
As you increase in the gaseous while you are in that state, the average kinetic energy is increasing, but the potential energy is staying the same. So changing the average kinetic energy while in the state, so moving the particles, but not changing the potential energy of the intermolecular forces. So those attractions and repulsions stay the same level of strength while you are in a state of matter. So now let's look at when you're in the act oh, of oops. going through a phase change. So if you're looking at the kinetic energy and the potential energy while in a phase change, so if I go from a phase change and I'm heating the temperature or raising the average kinetic energy from a solid to a liquid, you are melting, then now your average kinetic energy stays the same, but your potential energy is increasing. Same thing goes as you're going from a liquid to a gas or vaporizing. The kinetic energy stays the same, but the average potential energy is increasing. The opposite would be if you were cooling. So if you're cooling the gas to a liquid, which is condensing, your kinetic energy stays the same, but your potential energy is decreasing. Basically, that potential for interaction. Um, so, as you go through from a liquid to a solid, which is freezing, your kinetic energy stays the same, and your potential energy is getting smaller. You have increased organization, therefore more stability, therefore the stored potential energy decreases. You have an increased uh, ability to interact with another particle, therefore decreasing that potential energy. So to summarize, as you go through a phase change, the average kinetic energy stays the same, which means the temperature stays the same while undergoing a phase changes. And that means while I'm freezing, I have liquid and solid states of matter in equilibrium with each other and the temperature is staying the same. There is no change in temperature. Same with Condensing, when you go from a gas to a liquid, you are in equilibrium between gas and liquid states of matter. And the average kinetic energy is equal, therefore the temperature remains the same while in the phase change. Same for melting and vaporizing. Your potential energy is changing in a phase change. So the intermolecular forces are becoming stronger as you go from a gas to a solid, which makes your potential energy decrease and your intermolecular forces are becoming weaker as you go from a solid to a gas, which makes your potential energy increase. So now let's just look at the interaction between solid and liquid and while you were in the act of the phase change between a solid and a liquid. So heat transfers through friction. So remember, solids have vibrational movement. Therefore, solids do have kinetic energy. And so heat transfers through friction. So the potential energy of the liquid is higher than the solid. There's a looser structure, weaker intermolecular force, and it's endothermic. You had to absorb energy to overcome the intermolecular forces to go from a solid to a liquid, which is melting. So as you go from a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a gas and you are increasing temperature, then you are always absorbing heat through friction in order to have an endothermic change and change from solid to a liquid. 
The kinetic energy of the particles is exactly the same when the melting is occurring. Therefore, in equilibrium when it comes to temperature in the phase change. So now let's look at a heating curve. A heating curve is a graph showing the temperature changes that occur as a substance is heated from its solid state to its gaseous state. So this graph will show us changes in average kinetic energy. So on the slant, you have changing kinetic energy and potential energy stays the same. So all of these slants means you are in the state of matter or in a phase. So this would be your solid. This would be your liquid. Average kinetic energy is increasing. Potential energy is staying the same. And this slant is your gaseous state. So your average kinetic energy is increasing, potential energy is staying the same. While on the straight or horizontal line is where you have your phase changes. So this is melting. So your potential energy is increasing, but your kinetic energy is staying the same. And you're going from a solid to a liquid, but both of those phases are present in equilibrium. Here you have vaporization where your average potential energy is increasing. You're going from the liquid to the gas and your kinetic energy is staying the same. Your liquid and gas states or phases are found in equilibrium and your temperature stays the same. Average kinetic energy changes on the slants, potential energy changes on the straight or horizontal lines, and all phase changes occurring in a heating curve are endothermic. You are absorbing energy to go from a solid to a liquid and then from a liquid to a gas. The opposite of that would be a cooling curve, and I found a typo, so let's change this. This should be cooling curve. This is the graph that's showing the temperature changes that occur in a substance that is cooled from its gaseous state to its solid state. So again, this is showing you the average kinetic energy. So on your slants, you are in a phase, except now this phase is the gas, this phase is the liquid, this phase is the solid, our average kinetic energy is decreasing, but our potential energy is staying the same. Our average kinetic energy is decreasing, but our potential energy is staying the same. Our average kinetic energy is decreasing, but our potential energy is staying the same. On the straight or horizontal lines is when you are going through your phase changes. So here would be condensation because you're going from a gas to a liquid both phases found in equilibrium your potential energy is decreasing your kinetic energy is staying the same here you're going from a liquid to a solid in equilibrium so temperature is staying the same and you are found finding liquid and solid phases in equilibrium with each other. The potential energy is decreasing and the kinetic energy is staying the same. So same as with a heating curve, the average kinetic energy changes on the slants. The potential energy changes on the straight or horizontal lines. And this time, all phase changes that are occurring are exothermic. You are releasing average kinetic energy to go from the gaseous state to the liquid state to the solid state. So now let's look at what we're going to have to do for calculations for this. So when you have to calculate the enthalpy or the delta H, which for you is going to look and mean like Q. That is 
The enthalpy is, remember, the change of heat or work in the system. So we're going to analyze the segments that are involved to calculate the total amount of energy change based on what physical changes the substance incurs between the measured temperatures. So heating curves, H or delta H, will be positive in our endothermic absorbed energy. Cooling curves, H or delta H, will be negative exothermic released energy. During a temperature change, when you have one phase present, the slant on your graph, you're going to use Q equals MC delta T. Specific heats are unique to the phase of the substance present. So the C value or the joules per grams degree Celsius will change whether you have a solid, liquid, or gas because you know those intermolecular forces change. You're increasing intermolecular forces as you go to a solid. Therefore, it's going to require a different amount of energy to heat or cool that substance based on which phase of matter or state of matter is in. During a phase change, two phases are present in equilibrium, the straight or horizontal line, you're going to use Q equals mass times delta H with an X. The X could be fusion or vaporization. You're going to use the delta H of fusion, whether it is melting or freezing, and you're going to use the delta H of vaporization, whether it is vaporizing or condensing. Delta H is the latent heat or the amount of energy required to convert one gram of a substance from one phase to another phase. So there's some reference information for water. And those specific heats that we gave you, so we've given you specific heats for ice or solid water, liquid water, and steam. Notice those values do change based on which state of matter you are in. And we've also given you those specific heats in joules per moles degree C or joules per gram degree C. Then we've given you, given you the latent heats of fusion and the latent heats of vaporization, both in units of joules per gram or kilojoules per mole. Be aware of the melting and freezing points and vaporization or condensation points for the pure substance on the graph. These are different from water. So you know that it is zero degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius for water, but that will change on the substance that's in the graph. So if you do not have water in your graph, then your melting, boiling, Freezing condensation points will all be different. For all other pure substances, the specific heats and boiling, melting, and vaporization condensation points will be given, or you would be able to determine what these points were from the graphs because you know what the slants and horizontal lines mean. Okay, let's do an example problem together. So how many joules and calories does it take for 12 grams of ice at negative 20 degrees Celsius to become water at 10 degrees Celsius? So big thing I wanna look for here, ice and water. So I know I'm gonna use my reference values given in my course packet based on water. I know that I have an initial temperature of negative 20 degrees and a final temperature of 10 degrees. So big suggestion here is to draw this out. So I know that at zero degrees for water, I'm gonna go through a phase change. In this one in particular, because I'm going from negative 20 to 10, I'm going to be melting so remember what we said in the last couple of slides. The Q for in a phase is Q equals MC delta T with the specific heat being specific to the phase you are in. So you're a solid from negative 20 to zero. You're going through a melting. So you're going to then on the straight or horizontal line, you're going to use the latent heat. So mass, Q equals mass times delta H. And remember I said, you're gonna use fusion, whether it's for melting or freezing. And then you're gonna again use Q equals MC 
delta T this time, the specific heat will be a liquid.